Marianne Dalleth, we're sitting in your lovely studio here in Blind Ployf near Aberystwyth and it's wonderful to chat to you actually because we meet at a Stelvods generally <laughs> <laughs> and we talk about what's happened during the year and um, I think it was in the last Stelvod you kindly gave me your book 60 which is 60 photographs how difficult was it to put the 60 photographs together? Hugely difficult, really. Um, the idea, I thought, was quite a nice one. <laughs> because I was celebrating my 60th birthday, and it's usually, you know, people go on special tours, or they, you know, they wander around, or they have some kind of celebration. And what I decided to do was to go on a journey through my work from... I'd, um, been taking photos for 40 years and uh, it was an incentive also to try and get my archive which has been kept carefully um, with indexed uh, negative files however um, it hadn't been digitized and also I just had written lists of images so it gave me the incentive to actually get um, a list of all the images, well most of the images I've taken, uh, to put them in a Word document. So Word search now enables me to immediately find a negative. So that that was um, one way really of getting that kind of work done in the winter. Uh, but it was difficult because how do you choose 60 pictures? So what I did in the end um, until about uh, 2000, most of my work was black and white and film. Um, then there's a section where, until about 2004, where I was taking colour images, um, again on film. And then 2004, I went digital. So not only was there a huge range of subject matter, but also different media. Um, but it was it was an interesting process to go through. I, I couldn't look through absolutely everything, but what I did really was to look at each decade and then made my selections if I'd had an exhibition or what was the major thrust of my work in that decade and then made the selections. And the exhibition was in a, a, a space which was called alcoves. So and the it, exhibition was at the National Library, of course? Yes, it was in the National Library, in the Upper Gallery, which is almost like a series of little rooms. So um, in the book, um, I've more or less followed the order of the exhibition. It made a little more sense probably in the exhibition because you were walking into these spaces and each space had images of a similar theme and of a, you know, of a certain period. Did you make any discoveries while you were going through your archive? Yes, always. I mean, like all of us, you know, we go to do a job or something, but then there's about two or three images you might have taken or totally unrelated to the, to that job, uh, things you've actually seen, and those are not always recorded in detail um, in my uh, records. So it was nice to find the odd little image. Um, yeah. It's interesting, in the, uh, in the preface to your book, you talk about that first camera and your father's camera. What camera was it? Oh, gosh, do you know, I'm hopeless with technical things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was an Agfa, <coughs> I can't remember what they're called now, but one of those, you open, you open uh, it out. Oh, with the bellows? And... Yes, yes, it was uh, one of those. And what was the attraction? Well, I wondered what it was. I mean, the... the what is interesting, I was 10 years old and I distinctly remember the experience of asking my father, could I borrow the camera to take the picture? And it was quite a challenging subject because it was a cave with candles in it. Good gracious. Um, and I'm just wondering whether it was the light of those candles in that cave that made me decide I wanted to take that picture. Right. Um, it took ages and the whole family were fed up, I think, whilst I... <laughs> Sorted out, and now obviously I'd help with uh, with taking a, a meter reading, yeah. but it was quite a long exposure as well. Right. Um, but uh, yes, and and that's another discovery I made. I actually found that um, it was in a 
um, a scrapbook that my father had made, um, and uh, it was nice to. It was a nice starting point, really. Yes. So, was your father uh, an avid photographer, or was he an amateur photographer? And... He was an amateur photographer. He, he was actually a teacher who taught um, a number of subjects from art to. He he grew up in the period of the arts and crafts and. Uh, started teaching art and then went on to teach metalwork and in the end was teaching metalwork and engineering drawing. But he was very keen on photography. He had, uh, and I, I still remember as a very small child going up to the attic and we had a room caudal, as we called it, <laughs> which translated <laughs> means a messy room, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> which was just a dumping ground. But in that room, he had a little enlarger. And I remember being afraid to go into the room because it was dark and there was a little red light in the ceiling. Um, but after I'd ventured in and had enough courage to go in, I can still remember, like other people, I suppose, seeing for the first time a plain sheet of paper um, in a dish of what I thought was water and suddenly an image appeared you know um, and uh, it was such an exciting thing yeah. and that excitement I always felt in the dark room when you had a good image yeah and uh, and in a, in a way you still get that excitement in uh, using a digital camera I think when you look back yeah. or you that image appears on the screen out of, you know, in your browser or whatever. Was he a good photographer? He was, he was. He was um, meticulous. He, um, his main interest, uh, well, he, an interesting story was that he was in the Air Force uh, in, in the war and went over to Normandy and uh, worked as an engineer. And um, he sent uh, a letter to his mother asking, please, can you send my camera over? And the camera was sent over and he actually took quite a number of pictures in Normandy during the war. But then, after coming back, they were mostly um, romantic landscapes and photos of us as children. And also, in school, he would record, you know... Uh, Do you still have his archive? Yes, yes. Um, it's it's in, in tin cans and in boxes, and it's not uh, filed as such. Uh, but I did use some of his pictures. I had an exhibition in Ceredigion Museum a few years ago, uh, on the theme of memory and inheritance, and uh, I printed some of his pictures and put them up on the wall. Wow. It's funny you're talking about memory in boxes of tin cans full of pictures, because there are tin cans of pictures in everybody's house. <laughs> and I have a theory that, um, generally speaking, mothers are the gatekeepers of, of photographs in families. I don't know what, I mean, it's a huge generality, I know. <clears throat> Those boxes are really quite important, and... I was talking about this earlier today, actually, with uh, Chris Tancock, and we were. Um, I, uh, when I find boxes of photographs in old shops and things, and it's people's lives and people's memories, mm -hmm. and it's I find it quite tragic, really, that they're sitting there and nobody knows anything about them. So these archives are are really important, and in this digital age, of course, where everything is on hard drives, there isn't that. A uh, memory box, if you like, and uh, I like dipping into the memory box. Do you dip into your family's yes, memory box? Yes, yes, very often. There's one um, seminal image, a very important image, actually. It's in that book uh, where I found a picture he took of his mother in the field down there behind the house, uh, the third field, Casquar, as we call it. <laughs> and uh, I printed it and... Uh, I then took that photograph in my hand and took a photo in the exact place it was taken. Yeah. And to me that was a very moving experience because I, my, my grandmother died before I was born, so I never knew her. The only way that I know her really is by people's stories and by this photograph, which is a wonderful photograph as well. So it, it shows the importance, really, as you say, of keeping these family photos. And, tra and it, it just showed in a very direct way how photography can transfer memories from one generation 
to the next. Yeah, so which is vital, I think. And I know you travel a lot throughout Wales. I mean, you you have your camper van, your famous camper van. So I guess you've seen places change as well, Marian, because I guess you revisit lots of places. I have a feeling that you do. I don't know if that's true or not. Is it true? Yes, not not sometimes not deliberately, but but if you do take a lot of landscape photos or photos for books, I mean most of my work has been in in the publishing industry, mm. then you find yourself returning time and time again, um, and I find it very interesting, you know, um, because I'm taking photos from a different perspective now. Uh, as a young photographer, you're full of excitement and you're taking new images. Now that I've reached this age. I've got 40 years of images behind me. And so <clears throat> the perspective changes a bit, doesn't it? You, when you see a place that you might have photographed 30, uh, 30 35 years ago, um, I find that really interesting. And, and actually, I'm very much aware these days that when I'm taking a photo, I'm, I'm in that second, I'm in that moment. I can look back on the images I've taken in the past, but also with one eye towards the future, knowing that that will be a record of this moment, which will be kept for posterity. Yes. Um, and uh, um, the square mile is important, isn't it? Yes, that was really important. Because I, I first became um, involved and, and uh, passionate about photography when I went to Newport College of Art. But I didn't go there to study photography. I wanted to be a graphic designer. I was quite determined and, and sort of wanted to gain the skills to be um, a book designer. I was, I was that focused. But having gone to Newport, one day I sneaked into the lecture theatre where David Hearn was giving a lecture uh, on uh, photography. And um, suddenly I my eyes were open to this wonderful medium and then I would very often sneak into their lectures. And But one thing I was very much aware when I was in Newport, there were a lot of people working, taking photos in the South Wales Valleys, doing important work documenting uh, because of the location of the college, of course. Uh, so when I graduated from uh, Newport, I decided I wanted to spend more time exploring photography and documentary photography. So I was fortunate to be accepted in Birmingham for an MA course, which was quite new then. I mean, it wasn't a course as such. You went there with a programme of work. And um, I decided I wanted to document a hill farming area in Ceredigion, which was corresponding really to the work that was being done in South Wales. But I didn't see a lot of it being done in northern rural parts of, uh, and in farming communities in, in West Wales, and more specifically in a Welsh-speaking area, mm -hmm. um, because that, uh, the Welsh, um, most of my work really is within uh, Welsh language culture, um, and that was facing a crisis in the 1970s, because with rural depopulation, the communities that were the cradle of, of the Welsh culture were being uh, destroyed really, you know, people were moving away because it was impossible to earn a living. Uh, incomers were moving in at that time as holiday homes, you know. Mm. And so there was, a, there was these huge changes um, uh, happening mm. in the 70s. And of course the Vistir Square for you and, and people who speak Welsh um, resonate with the work of DJ Williams. Yes. Who wrote about these kind of communities and was a, a famous Welsh language author. So I took that as a theme, uh, as a title for the exhibition, but also, um, I mean, it describes the kind of close-knit communities that existed in, in rural Wales and still do to, to uh, a large extent. Um, but I also took the literal meaning of that because I, you know, it was the age of conceptual work and, and I thought it would be interesting to go back to the earliest maps I could find of the Manithbach area, mm -hmm. which were tithe maps. And then I marked uh, an exact square mile and made a note of every um, home um, uh, or dwelling that was marked within that area and visited each location. And some of them were ruins, um, some of them were, uh, you still had Welsh uh, families 
going back generations farming there. Uh, some were holiday homes and some were just empty. But what was interesting, and I, I did, to be fair, I did also select a square mile that I felt was a kind of microcosm, if you like, of that kind of mm. community. But there were two shops, um, a chapel, a school and a church within that um, square mile. And uh, today um, they've all gone. Well, in fact, the schools and the church and the chapel uh, was closed within a few years of my having recorded um, it. So it was an important record. It was a time of uh, great change. Did you get to know the people? Yes. Um, I think I had an advantage in the sense that because although I was considered a townie <laughs> coming from Aberystwyth, <laughs> I still, my father obviously came from this area, so... Um, I belong to the same kind of culture and background in a way. And so I think I probably gained access and trust uh, quite quickly, really. Um, and uh, there were some amazing characters there. And uh, the sad thing is that only a few weeks ago, Emir Hopkins, who was, um, he and his family were great help in making, helping me with connections. He's recently died. Um, but he was uh, really interested in, in the history of the area as well. Do you think you'll ever go back and revisit and reshoot? Well, I did go back. I, the initial project was in 1976-77. I then went back in 2006-2007 um, um, to re-photograph. And I, um, I haven't done a huge amount with that work so far. I think I would probably make one visit again and, and bring the work together um, because it shows the, the changes that have occurred uh, in the rural areas and, and in the farming community um, and also in, in the method of farming, you know. Yes, indeed. And uh, so, yes, it, I, I, um, I think it's an important record. Right. Uh, but it hasn't been, you know, I had a, a, an exhibition back in 76 and a small exhibition within that area upon Manisbach in 2007 and a TV documentary was made of my work there right. so that is how important is exhibiting to you I like to exhibit it uh, exhibitions are quite time consuming but I, I quite like it in the sense that it's a it's a different method of communicating I think also it focuses your mind when you're actually selecting a certain amount of images um, and uh, it's a slower process, isn't it, than just selecting images, putting them on screen. Um, so, yes, I have. I, in fact, last year it was, um, I had three exhibitions which on, on top of the work in the National East Yes. So it was uh, a bit too hectic <laughs> last year. Uh, but I think, it, I think it's, uh, you know, tied in with the exhibition then. I will usually give a talk and, and it gives me a chance to engage with the public, which people who do not necessarily go on the internet and will look for images, you know. Yeah. And I think it's um, it's quite nice to be able to share images that you've taken within a locality with the people who were involved and in, in are part of the project, really. Yes, and what sort of... What sort of... Um the ad button, Sisnek. I'm I'm looking for the English word. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the reaction. What's sort a of reaction do you get from uh, uh, showing your work? How do people, especially people who are probably maybe not used to going to exhibitions, um, uh, what sort of feedback on, do you get? On the whole, I think they're quite thrilled. They're quite you know because sometimes you know you I I am careful that if I'm photographing somebody that I have their permission before the uh, before exhibiting or, or publishing or whatever um, and sometimes you're a bit wary you know what, what you know you think you you know you've got a really good image and, and you're afraid of what if they refuse permission you know but on the whole I think people are quite thrilled and uh, and it's it's interesting to hear the discussion that goes on amongst people who are not involved with photography um, and it was really quite wonderful to read some of the comments in uh, the National Library in, in the Visitor's Book. That uh, that gave me um, 
you know, because photography sometimes can be a, a lonely old profession, you know. Yes, uh, that's actually, uh, that's a little thread I'd like to follow. Um, because to me, it is, um, uh, it is the loneliness of it is its beauty in many respects. Because you're locked into, I get into a bit of a zone after a little while. It takes me a bit of time to get into that sort of frame of mind of um, of working an area or working with people or um, and I, I lock off and I become my I, it's an inward sort of thing and the only way I can deal with a situation is through my camera do you find the same thing yourself yes I, I think um, the camera also I think um, is is a tool for contemplation as well you know um, and I think it makes me see the world in a, not in a different way but it makes you look and and I think it's a tool that I use really for developing an understanding of the world you know it's not just about taking pictures is it and no. snapping not not in my case anyway yeah I agree um, with you yes yeah. and um, I think I have grown <laughs> <laughs> if you like uh, by using photography and using the camera. Um, you say you um, you sneaked into David Hearn lectures. What was it about David Hearn that made turn that switch in your head to think well, this is what I really want to do? I think first of all, showing the work of brilliant photographers that have worked in the past uh, and photographers you would not really come across unless somebody actually presented their work to you. I think also he was a he, he well he still is uh, a very good communicator, um, and can convey a commitment, uh, and also the ethics of photography. I think you know, um, and so I found. Oh, let's expand a little on the ethics of photography. Well, do people you know? Um, really think about that side of things when they see people with cameras. Um, and I think it was, I think it was really about showing that as a photographer you have a responsibility um, towards the subjects that you're taking. Uh, that is something I take quite seriously. I, I don't like to feel that I'm using people. Mm -hmm. I think that can be done sometimes. I think it it is. Yes. Uh, it's a factor in some some people's work. I think I feel uncomfortable with some images. Yes. Um, so I think it it, it um, I think because he is a committed photographer, um, uh, possibly that came across as well, you know, and um, and I just thought it was a, a brilliant medium really um, for observing the world around us. Uh, also, I was then and and still am to a certain extent quite a shy person. And I think photography is a brilliant medium for somebody who is just a little bit shy uh, because it enables you just to be quiet in the background and, and see events developing and you're recording them. And, and that's the kind of photography that I really like. You, I, I mean, recording, um, uh, uh, recording the, the world around us, do you think that is the main purpose of a photographer? Is that our only purpose, do you reckon? I don't think it's the only purpose. Um, I think that photography can be used for all number of purposes. I think the one thing that all of us can give is presenting the way that we see things. So it, it and, and presenting images in a way that hopefully makes other people think about the subject matter. Yes. Um, so it's not just about purely recording, is it? Yeah. Otherwise, we we'd just be walking around and clicking cameras without thinking. You can you can actually record. You can actually record without a thought process behind it, really. Can you? Yes, and I think the thought process is is uh, very valuable because it allows. Um, I see that's this is the problem I have probably with the digital age, if you like is that the fact that there is less care is taken with photography and less time is given to photography uh, and is everything is the photographer becomes the last link in a chain i find uh, especially with a lot of work i do i don't know if you feel the same uh, in that respect 
Yes, I mean, looking the way I, I've developed, I mean, I'm also someone that at the end of each year will reflect on what I've done during that year. Um, because we, when we're taking images, we're working within time space. Hmm. But also, when you think of it, we're also operating within time space in our own lives. Yes. <laughs> in the last few years, I've um, turned away really from commercial work and, and doing, I'm doing, I'm earning less money these days, but I'm working on my own personal projects because I know I've only got a certain amount of time left. So, you know, I've got less time left than I've had. <laughs> so I want to use it wisely and I want to prioritise. And uh, I'm also a bit disillusioned with digital photography in the sense that it, it has become so easy just to take a picture. Um, and I, I've never been a photographer that just likes going, taking pictures every day, all day, you know, uh, of anything at all. Um, I'd rather work on, on subjects that are important to me or themes that are important. Um, uh, even if it means, uh, and I, th I think you have to devote time to that. You can't just fit it in in half an hour after finishing a job for somebody else. You know? mm. And also I find we all have our own voice. And I think that is the unique thing that we can give and use. Uh, I think the tendency with a lot of commercial work, I find that I'm producing work that I know the client wants which might not be the way that I see the world or the way that I want to create images. And so it's quite nice to sort of take a step away from that uh, and just slow down, really. Um, I think it's very... I, I don't... I've been tempted to go back to using film. I can quite understand why photographers use film. Um, what I've tried to do is, is to go back to the way that I used to work with film, although I'm using a digital camera because I think um, there's too much just taking pictures and then editing and finding, you know, it's, a, it's easy to have a law of averages, isn't it? If you mm. take a hundred pictures and then you look through them all, say, oh, I like that one. Mm. Well, that's not just what it's about, is it? You yes, um, I, I agree with you because when I, uh, because I sort of began being professional on the cusp of film and, and so I did a bit of film, but then it was digital seemed the obvious route to go. Um, and when I first started shooting digitally, I used to shoot, oh, I don't know, hundreds of pictures. And it, uh, when I look back at the stuff, I mean, there was only f very few of them were really that, that good, to be honest. So and uh, now I shoot very little, where I used to fill cards before with stuff. <laughs> Um, I barely fill half a card now or even a quarter of a card when I go because I know, you know, you kind of know instinctively, you know, that the stuff you're doing and the angles you're taking is correct. So if we, if going back to film, lots of people would say that would be a retrograde step. But is it the slowing down that you think is the key to that? Well, it's a different medium as well. You know, so there are different qualities with with film. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I would do it. Firstly, I think just to slow myself down. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, to put it mildly, yes. Yeah. Have you worked in larger formats as well, or have you been thirty-five mil? No, I um at one I have done medium format. Um, at one time I had a well, I still have got a Hasselblad. I still haven't got rid of it. Um, and that, especially with landscape work, um, and there is something really quite lovely about just having 12 <laughs> exposures. So you are thinking carefully about what you're taking and being very selective. Um, but I couldn't do that all the time because I, uh, sometimes I, I do see myself very often um, as an instinctive photographer. It's, I mean, instinct is not the right word because it's not completely instinctive. Um, but I will respond to, to uh, what's around me um, as opposed to having some kind of pre-visualization uh, and, and seeking a certain image. Uh, but sometimes, of course, with commissions, you have to do that. Yeah. You know what the client wants, and so you're looking for it. Yeah. 
you're working on a particular project which is very close to your heart i know you're working on uh, about and um, making pictures about bardsey uh, island and essentially which is a far nicer name than bardsey um sorry about that but it is and essentially is and essentially um how important is that island to you it became hugely important to me um i first went there for commissioned work actually i needed a picture of the island for the book Cymru or Hyd, uh, or Eternal Wales as it was uh, translated. Yeah. Um, and I went there for a day. Which was the stuff for, uh, where Gunvor Evans uh, yes. wrote the text. Yeah. And I think that was about, uh, that was in 2000, the year 2000. Uh, I was using film and uh, it was a, an awful day in terms of weather, but I did manage to get a few pictures. But I just fell in love with the island. I literally just fell in love with the island. Um, and so I then used to visit every year and have a week there. And I think part of the attraction of the place was that you're going back, you know, 15 years. Uh, there was only uh, one place you could have a mobile phone signal. And it, it meant w walking out to some rock, you know. And once you're on the island, unless you climb up to the mountain, you don't see the mainland at all. So it was just the best way, really, to have a chill out, you know, because nobody could get in touch with me. I couldn't see, nothing reminded me of all the pile of work that I needed to get done. And so I think that was partly the attraction. Um, but then having, com you know, all I did there, well, I uh, there mostly was, was take pictures anyway. So I had about 15 years of pictures. Um, and it was the complete opposite of the last book I did, which was 100 Places in Wales to Visit. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so I went from visiting 100 places in all parts of Wales to concentrating on a little island that's uh, about yeah. a mile long, you yeah. know. I'm, I'm intrigued. How did you tackle 100 Places in Wales? I mean, obviously, there was the, you, had a, you had a list, a bucket list of places to visit. And tackling all these places because of obviously weather and everything affects the yeah. photograph. Yeah. So how do, how on earth did you go about it, Mara? It was uh, a challenge. Uh, at times it was wonderful. At other times it was so frustrating, because actually the two years that I did most of the work for it were the worst two summers we've had. <laughs> And I, I was trying to group the places, so I would go in my camper for three or four days. Um, and invariably, the first day would be, you know, I'd keep one eye on the weather forecast. Um, I didn't, I couldn't always go there because I was doing part-time teaching anyway and doing other commercial work. So I would travel up and I'd have one day wonderful light and everything. Then the following day, it'd probably be pouring with rain. Um, and that's why some of the images in the book are quite close. Um, I, I actually quite like the idea of going to a location and taking a, a wide vista or a wide shot. And then very often I'll zoom into a very small detail within that location. Yeah. That, that I find really interesting. Yeah. And of course, by using both images, you are making the link. Yeah. Um, uh, but some of those images were taken simply because the weather was so awful that there was no way I could get a decent uh, uh, wide shot. You know. Of those hundred places that you visited and photographed, were you given a brief, by the way? I, I am intrigued. Were you given a brief <laughs> or, or was it, Marianne, go and shoot 100 places in Wales? What do you think? You've worked in Welsh publishing. <laughs> What happened was I actually went to the Lolva with a few ideas for books and they didn't they didn't fancy any of my ideas. But they then turned around and said, well, we don't really want to publish anything on, on those ideas. But how about going around Wales? We've got this idea of publishing a book, 100 places in Wales you should visit before you die. And, you know, you, well, do you ever refuse a job? I thought, well, you know, that sounds interesting, you know. Uh, at the time, they hadn't even got an author. Um... And I, I said, well, you can, okay, fine, you know. Um, what was unexpected was that John Davis went on a different tangent to what other people probably would have done. I mean, this was a time of, you know, um, publishing all kinds of uh, books on 100 places or, mm -hmm. 100, you know, um, which are mostly beautiful places or very romantic places. 
but John decided that it he would take advantage of this um, opportunity to introduce people to the industrial history of Wales. So although there were a few sort of romantic places, there were a lot of churches, <laughs> but also um, a lot of post-industrial areas. Um, and that was fascinating. You know, it was completely different to what I would have expected. Um, had its own challenges, but um, really I'm grateful for that because it, it led me to places I wouldn't have gone before, you know, down in the uh, indus- post-industrial areas of South Wales right. and North Wales as well. So you have a library of OS maps, I guess, uh, Mark? They, I always carry them in the van. I've all, yeah. for, uh, since I can remember, I've always had vans, you know, this one I've had since 2004. And I've got two box files full of OS maps, which have got all kinds of notes on them and and stars and and, <laughs> and circles and squares and uh, they might make a nice exhibition one day. <laughs> they might indeed, actually. They probably would make a smashing exhibition. <laughs> well, actually, on that, I, I was uh, earlier this year. Um, I was looking at uh, the catalogue of Kudelka's exhibition. Um, Nationality Doubtful, which yeah. I, has been in America, is going. It's, if it's not already there, it is going to. It's going to Spain, I think, later this year. And there's a lovely double-page spread in the back of that book of his notes uh, on maps, which is fascinating, and it's an artwork in itself. Yeah, of those hundred places. Go, go on, I got to ask you the question. I'm like one place. Oh, I can I can never choose. I really I really can't. And okay, and by two. now it, it's so much in the past. I can't even remember the hundred places. You know, um, it's very difficult to choose. And and of course, what, what was really funny was John and I had uh, well, not a huge argument, but we had a, a disagreement because he hasn't included an essentially. And I said, you must include an essentially. Um, in my mind, it's one of the wonders of Wales. And he said, no, 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 no. In fact, there are very few areas on the Sleen Peninsula, which I think is a wonderful part of Wales. It is a wonderful part of yeah, Wales. Yeah. It's, um, you know, Trirkeiri and all those places. Yes, uh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And I remember going to Natgwthen before it became, uh, you know, a centre to learn Welsh. Wasn't it fantastic? Uh, it was yeah, a fantastic yeah, place. Yeah. We used to go there on little pilgrimages and uh, throw rocks into the sea at Natgwthen. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Um, yeah, and go to, you know, little villages in, in, in Pentley. Yeah. Strange I, that, isn't it, yeah. that he, he didn't pick many from that area? Well, I think his argument with, with an, first of all, he'd never been there anyway. <laughs> and he had no intention of going there because he didn't, he felt there was, uh, his theme was that man had left his mark on these areas. And of course they have in, on an essentially. Yeah. But never mind. Yeah. But the one the one place that I always go back on a kind of pilgrimage because it's a place that I and you've been there as well, I think, I really like is um uh, the Elias Valley. Yeah. Um Capilafine. Yes, beautiful. That area. There is something special about that part of the of Wales. Yeah. That I, I first yeah, sort of saw it when I was in college and I will still make a visit there um, at some point every year in my camper yeah. and just camp overnight and listen to the hooting of the owls and <laughs> yes it's extraordinary I find the trees there extraordinary yes it's, it's a wonderful landscape and there's a uh, there's a wonderful atmosphere there as well yes and um, you can see how Eric Gill and David Jones and, yes. and people like that were Attracted. Yes, I was intrigued because you, when you look at the trees, you can see David Jones's pa- his, uh, paintings. Uh, yes, you know, yeah, they, yeah. They're extraordinary. Yeah. And um, I, I found <laughs> what was strange about it is that, that you have a. Uh, um, uh, a nonconformist? Nonconformist chapel there and the, the church itself. Yeah. And they both live equally nicely together. Yes. And they're quite close, aren't they? The, uh, yes, but I found Capel of Fien, um and the yew trees in Capel of Fien really, I find yew trees. Do, uh, do you like trees? Yes, uh, you can see them out through the window there. And yeah. it's fascinating. I mean, every time, you know, just looking out through the studio, the, the window, uh, sometimes they're, they're shrouded in mist. And, and uh, they're mostly yew trees. Um, yew we want then? 
Okay. Nah, okay. Uh, ash. 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 They're, yeah. mostly, ash. <coughs> they're mostly ash trees, so they've only recently come into full um, leaf, you know. Yeah. And they're like skeletons in the winter, and then, uh, yeah. But um, I think trees are an important aspect of our landscapes. Really. Yes. But I, I like the trip from Capilafine over the mountain as well. That's a, a, a nice area. Yeah. And bleak. Um, I, uh, the last time I went there, it was it was the mist had come in really hard, and it was drizzle, and it was. Um, and I met a hedger by Capilafine. <laughs> I did. I met a hedger, and he made hedges, and uh, very interesting folded gentleman. Them. Folded them, yes, yeah, yeah. and explained to me that folding there was different to folding ten miles down the road. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I find that those serendipitous moments when you're out uh, taking photographs are very joyous. I don't know if you feel the same thing, and if you had any experiences. Oh, wonderful. I, I remember one morning, early in the morning, I was up the, right at the top of the Towie Valley and I, I was taking photos again for the Gwynver Evans book, I think. And suddenly I just heard clip clop, clip clop. In the, in the distance, um, I could hear the hooves of a horse coming down and met a lovely young man who uh, lived in um, Newport in Pembrokeshire and uh, in the winter would travel... The, the the roots of the uh, porthmin, what are they? The, the drovers. The drovers, yeah. Over the mountain and would just uh, with his horse, and he had a horse and a dog, and would um, you know sleep in barns or whatever, and you just meet these wonderful people and it, it, it there's something there was something so wonderful about it you know. Um, uh, did you take the opportunity to photograph him as well? Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> So, and essentially, the Bardsey project is well on its way. Uh, you've done the hard work, I guess, and the editing of the pictures. And I believe you designed the book as well, yes? Yes, that's one advantage, really, because um, although I've never stopped taking pictures since 1974, I've earned my living, well, I earned my living for many, many years as a book designer. Uh, so because I've got the skill of a designer, well, I hope I have <laughs> by now, <laughs> uh, it it enables me to control the way that my pictures are used, <laughs> which I think is the bane of many photographer. Once your photos have gone to the publisher, sometimes you just have no control about how the way they appear. That, or... that is a very frustrating thing. That's one of the most frustrating things I've found of late. Yeah. is the inability to control what happens. And people pick your... You send your photographs in, you've edited them down, but they require so many photographs, and then they choose. And I find that really great sometimes. Mm. I don't know. Really, but. And, and also, to be fair, I, I hope, uh, you know, throughout the years, when I've been dealing with other photographers' photographs, that I have taken a lot of care because I know how they would have approached the work and how much effort has gone into composing those pictures. And very often you'll find, you know, some people will just crop pictures indiscriminately mm. and, and it, it destroys the whole image um, and the image that the photographer uh, Yes, created. I know. The one dreadful, and I won't mention who or where, but they squashed one of my photographs, which was one of the worst <laughs> things that... I've ever seen in my whole life. When I opened the book, I was most distressed. They literally squashed the photograph. It was a landscape, and they pushed it all in, and everything is out of kilter and distorted. I, w I was shocked that they that they even thought about doing that sort of thing. You know. Well, that's that's the problem of digital using in design, isn't it? I mean, I, I you know, I when I think the. The days that I would spend designing a book in the days when you actually had to draw every single square and you had to paste all the pictures in and you scaled all your photographs. Uh, these days, um, you know, you can in InDesign, you can just change the shape of that frame and lazy designers or people who are not particularly careful with images will simply squash your photo to fill whatever gap they have. Yes. Um, yes. Whereas it should be the other way around, you know, the image, and then you you fit your text around the image. But, do you uh, do you think your uh, your uh, career really as a designer then has um, has informed the way you photograph, the way you frame stuff? 
uh, uh, um, perhaps you'd like to explain a little bit of that sort of thought process? yes because uh, to me composition is hugely important in in images um Having said that, I know I've probably lost a couple of pictures because I was so concerned with composing within that frame that I might have missed a, an important moment. Um, but I still, uh, in my mind, very often when you've got two images, um, you're comparing them, then composition is hugely important. I mean, Katja Brisson was, was the classic, mm. wasn't he? Mm. And he had this um, technique that he used that when he couldn't decide between... Um, you know, two or three pictures, he would turn them upside down so they wouldn't make sense in terms of the subject matter. Mm. And then he would see which ones had the strongest formal elements mm -hmm. or, um, and, you know, the contrast of black and white. And he would make a selection on that. And I don't do that, but uh, I'm, I, I think it's almost inevitable, isn't it, that if you've uh, been working as a designer... Um, that it does influence the way that you compose your pictures in the frame. Um, and equally, when I'm taking photographs um, for somebody else, uh, I know that a designer is going to have the challenge of, of fitting text and images together. Yeah. So I will take my pictures in a way that gives him a certain amount of leeway. Um, or I'll take a, a series of landscape and portrait, mm -hmm. so that um, if he has to choose between them, at least I'm certain that I'm happy as well that the image fits within the format. Do you... Th I mean, it's, I, maybe this is a silly question, and shoot me down in flames if you think it is, but do you think there's such a thing as Welsh photography? I'm not sure how concerned I am about that, I, in the sense that um, I, I think there's a danger that you call something Welsh, that people have some preconceived idea of what mm. it should be. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, in terms of... Being Welsh, I consider anybody who comes to live here and who um, has respect and, and appreciates the history of this nation and, uh, and the multicultural aspects of it, um, um, they're Welsh, you know, and, and uh, we wel I, I welcome them with open arms. Um, but the danger is that if you say Welsh photography, that it has to be a certain kind of... Uh, I think it is important... I mean, one thing I have done throughout the years is um, the one area we haven't spoken about is that I've um, taken a huge amount of documentary work on activism of all kinds and mm. campaigns. Mm. And that means uh, the, the road to self-determination in yes. Wales, yes. Um, the campaigns for the Welsh language. Yes. But I see those side by side with campaigns for the environment and really um, everything that makes this world a better place. Um, <laughs> And uh, I had an exhibition in Cardiff quite a few years ago now entitled Radical, where I brought all these elements together. And um, because I, I think sometimes people can become a bit obsessed um, thinking that somehow campaigning for the Welsh language is somehow narrow-minded or whatever, where it's part of the overall campaign to, to make this um, world a better place and, and to give every language and, and culture the respect that uh, it deserves. Do you think, I, I, again, a very general statement, but I think in Wales we, t we tend to be, we don't see pictures. I don't know if that's true or not. I think uh, we get pushed to one side, that image makers are pushed to one side, that it's the word that's important in Wales, or if you sing, it's even more important. But do you know what I mean? Yes. yes. Uh, I, and um, I, I sometimes find that um, the frustrating aspect of being Welsh, I suppose. Do you find that? Certainly in the past. I think things are changing a bit now because, you know, young people are being educated in visual arts. And I, I think the education system probably is, is, is a bit um, helps in that respect. But yes, it's true. I mean, um, and it's because Wales has such a, um, uh, an old, a long tradition of bardic history yes. and, and, and literature. Yeah. Um, so I think it is, um, to go back to this business of Welsh photography, yes, I, I think we should be and I think you're doing a great job in that, really, in seeing what's being done in Wales. Um, I think we should really be um, having a discussion about um, how to 
how we present ourselves really mm-hmm. and how we record um uh, um and that um welsh photography is is considered like czech photography or you know um, <laughs> or australian photography yes, indeed. Or european photography really yeah. in, in the tradition of of european photography you know. and what about being a woman working in photography in wales <laughs> That is really interesting. I I've, I've never um considered myself as I am a female photographer, you know. No, and no. and interestingly, I haven't really gone down the road of of um uh working with issues that are important to women, I suppose. Sometimes it can be quite lonely because um I I, I still remember going to Birmingham to the photography school there. And I was there at the end of August because I, I was doing the MA. And then gradually they had a whole host of courses there in uh, city and guilds and, and degree courses. And uh, I was seeing all these new students coming in. And I think uh, even though they, you know, as the, the second year was better, but I think I was, were we half a dozen women in there? Or, you know, young women then? In, in hundreds of, of students, really. And um, uh, it's only now that I've suddenly, you know, looking, because we get to a certain age and we look back, um, there haven't been many women photographers, I don't think, that have been working for 40 years, I would imagine. No. You know, um, and that's interesting. You know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm special because of that, but it is an interesting, uh, I think these days there are more, you see more, young women photographers, and that's a great thing. Yeah. Uh, but there are times it has been quite lonely, um, especially as sometimes it, it... There is a... I think sometimes I do feel there's a bit of a macho. Um. <laughs> Have you developed sharp elbows? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> No, I find it very difficult, but I have been elbowed a few times uh, right. uh, uh, in circumstances where it wasn't even necessary, really, yeah. to get the shot. Yeah. Um, but I, I've got my own technique. Because I'm small, I can actually go underneath their arms and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly they have this head appearing in front of them. <laughs> but I don't do it too often, but I have, I have been known to go under, underneath people's arms to get my shot. Right. And it's an interesting, uh, an interesting angle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what next for Balandere? Well, a bit of a chill out after the book. Um, I, I can't remember when I last had a holiday. So, but uh, I've, I have, um, in order to keep myself alive, last year I did start a 10-year project, which I'm not telling anybody about, in the hope that it'll keep me going for 10 years. <laughs> Can you give us a little... Clue? No, 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 I'm not saying anything until at least oh, five Marianne, years. Oh, Marianne, you tears. <laughs> but what I would like to do with it, I have, I have got some loose ends on some projects. Um, I would also like to do some more travelling. I did go to Africa and did a project in Swaziland yeah. uh, in 2004. So I want to return there. Um, and... In order to do things like that, you need to devote time. You can't fit it in amongst, you know. So this next year now, I'm hoping to do some more travelling. And and also thinking of a journey in my camper van, I think would be a good, good idea. Yes, good old I have this van. idea of, um, of just jumping into the van and just travelling south. No plans, nothing at all. And see where I end up. Taking photos on the way. <laughs> And stopping for lengthy periods, maybe, along the way. <laughs> and making not... nice cups of tea in your van. And, and, and uh, it's, um, it's my dream to have a van. So if you sell yours, Marian, I'll buy it. Right. OK. <laughs> I'll remember that. There's the Philip George Griffiths exhibition happening. How important a photographer do you think he was? Hugely important. And I think we can be so proud that he was the Welsh photographer. Um, you know, there's no need to go on about how... Um, sorry, I'm just a little... Um, uh, yes, I think he was... I, I, I had the privilege of meeting him a few times. Didn't know him well, but he would come to the Lens Festival in the National Library. Um, I was... I had the privilege of... of 
giving him a tribute after his death in, in that festival, um, which was a very moving experience. Uh, it's a shame we didn't have him for a few more years, but in, uh, I think he's uh, fantastic, you know, absolutely hugely important mm. in terms of commitment, in terms of, um, I think, do, do we all have this desire to leave the world a better place than it was when we arrived? Yes, which um, is one of his big maxims, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and he certainly did that yeah. by, by raising awareness of, of man's inhumanity. Well, Viet um, Vietnam Inc. was a seminal yeah, yeah. Um, a book. And uh, as well, he didn't forget his roots either. Rithin and, uh, and talking about Wales was um, no. quite important to him. And he, um, I think I read uh, in, there's some stuff in the Recollections uh, book about um, him unable to cross the road because people were coming and going on their holidays and things with his family and he was going to chapel and... Um, He's, he didn't mince his words. No. And uh, I think he didn't, mince his, he didn't mince his words as photographically either, did he? No, no. And, 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 and in Wales, that, there aren't many people like that, really. I think, you know, I think who, when you're talking about not mincing his words. And, uh, and interesting perspective as well, where he could see the similarity between, for instance, the, the drowning of... Trewerian or Kapel Kellin yeah. with what was happening to the culture in, in Vietnam. Yes. And, and um, for to make that link, I think, is, uh, is important, you know. And, and Do you think there will ever be a place where we can see Philip Jones Griffiths' work, whether he was because he wanted to have, uh, you know, his legacy wanted... Um, and his legacy he felt was important and that it should be here in Wales. Do you think we'll ever see? Oh, well, I'm sure we yes. will. I'm sure we will. Um, I mean, I don't know what the latest is, but I thought there were very definite plans. Ah, right, OK. Where his, his, his uh, work will be archived and kept in the National Library, but there will be an exhibition space in this new development in Bangor, am I correct? I wouldn't know. I don't know um, that uh, I, I believe that is the the plan. That was the intended plan, uh, but of course there have been problems with this place in Bangor. But yes. um, uh, it was his desire that both aspects be together, that the storage and the archival, uh, and with a place to educate uh, young people especially, yes. uh, would be in one location. But that is not possible in the National Library. Mm. Um, but they, they, I'm looking forward to the exhibition. Oh, me too, um, yes. And also, of course, they've got the archival storage uh, to keep his work in pristine condition. Uh, but certainly, and, and hopefully, there will be publications. And, and um, mm. uh, it's been, you know, it's important, isn't it? You mentioned education there. And, uh, um, and I think that's something we touch upon when we have these discussions. Uh, how There are numerous courses now. To, to learn how to be a photographer, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, what's your take on that? Do, how do you do? You think that uh, that it's a good thing, a bad thing, or that are too many people going in that direction? Or what do you think? Well, the part time teaching I did was on the foundation course and uh, in on national diploma in Colleague Marion Duiver, right. and. Um, I enjoyed doing that because I, I just felt strongly that young people in rural mid Wales or North Wales should have the same opportunity to see how they could develop into the field of photography if they chose to. Um, I, I'm a great believer in, in teaching photography in the context of other media. Uh, right. As opposed to being just in, you know, photography, or at least I think I think it's important for students of photography to be mixing and and socialising with artists, with other visual artists. Um, I, I I don't think it should be, you know, be in a narrow, little sort of um, place kind of thing. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, the British Journal of Photography has currently got um, a series of articles on various colleges and their methods of teaching. Um, and I think Paul Searight in Belfast 
uh, his great um, uh, his theory is that what is important is is encouraging young photographers to develop their own voice and their own you know what the unique way that they see the world uh, and I think that's the way forward really you know um, do you the, think there's enough work for them out there I no mean. I am um, I, th- I think uh, oh, years ago I remember reading somewhere that there were more photographers being trained in the UK than were working in the whole of Europe in one particular year. Um, so, but that, but that's true of all subjects, isn't it? You know, all yes. the people studying philosophy. You know, for, <laughs> that doesn't. It's not a reason for not studying philosophy. Is Indeed, it? not. No, yeah. no, no, no. Or any other subject, really. No, no. Uh, so, do you think they? Um... But sorry, one thing I should say, of course, I don't think it's necessary for someone to go through formal education to become a photographer. No. And I think some of the very interesting work being done these days is by young people and not so young people who have never received a formal training. Yeah. Um, and especially these days, there's, there, are, there, there is so much opportunity, really, to teach yourself, isn't there? You know, yes. and, and, and on the internet... The you know the wealth of images too much really. <laughs> I think it's a visual diarrhea sometimes when you go on the internet. <laughs> if you had the opportunity, if somebody uh, a young person came along and said, and showed their portfolio to you, would you think about mentoring a young person? Yes, I think it's hugely important. I, um, one thing that I don't see a lot of young photographers in this area at the moment, and I think it's a shame. Um, perhaps it's because they they work in their own fields, don't they? They you know they they enjoy just taking pictures and and using social media. Um, but I, I've um, I, and I really enjoyed teaching. You know, I didn't enjoy the paperwork, <laughs> um, and I didn't enjoy being too constricting, being constricted in in what I should teach. <laughs> But uh, encouraging young people is hugely important because they're the future. And, and, and I think that, you know, I think people such as you and myself, um, I would like to think that we have got a few skills and, and uh, to share and, and really to help them to see themselves. Uh, yes, to, I think that I think that's the and I've noticed as well. I don't know. I've only done mentoring once and I insisted that uh, um, the Earth, actually, yeah. uh, Welsh League of Youth, for those of you who don't know, the Earth, um, big movement in Wales. Um, and the last time I worked for them, I insisted that they actually bring somebody from the college to work with me during the Eisteddfod week for at least three days. Yeah. And just to follow me yeah, and I could yeah. send them off on little briefs, etc. Yes. Yeah. And that worked really well. But what I found was... I, I thought that young people were really quite confident, but there, there is not that confidence there, is there? No, and, and, and you can understand why, you know. Yes. Um, and also the the most difficult thing really is editing, isn't it? You know, selecting the work. Yeah. I find it difficult, you know. Yeah. After all these years, I still find it difficult to edit my own work. So you can imagine for young people, it, it's so much more confusing, really. And and I think one of the great things we can do is actually point out to them, um, you know, the merits in their work, which they possibly are not seeing, you know. Yes. Maybe yeah. we should start a movement to mentor young kids. Uh, in well, it'd be a great idea. I, think, you know, yes. I, I mean, I do uh, hold, uh, you know, I have uh, workshops in the art centre um, and uh, not just young people. I mean, recently, you know, I've been involved also with people over 50, mm. you know, sort of... Uh, uh, you can be young in mind, even though you might be over fifty. And uh, I think a lot of people now, especially people, you know, retiring early, um, appreciate um, uh, the advice. And 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 of course, digital photography means that it's it's revolutionised photography. Really, well, it's democratised it? it as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know, and 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 I think a lot of people appreciate guidance in how to. They they enjoy taking pictures. But they do like a bit of guidance and, and, and gaining confidence, really, in making their own decisions about what makes a good picture. Mm. Mentoring and the whole process of mentoring a young person. Are we going back to a previous age of, uh, of apprenticeships? And uh, how do you think that could work practically with a professional photographer? 
I mean, I, 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 I'm a great um, fan of apprenticeships, I think. I think it had its merits. Um, yes, it goes back to an age where you were transferring a skill, uh, which is not quite the same thing. We're talking something more... We are talking about sharing and, you know, sort of developing skills, but also developing uh, awareness, aren't we? And, and a method of working. Um, and... I think the advantage, if you've got the right, of course, you could be unfortunate and, and not have the right person. But, I mean, with the right mix of one-to-one -one discussions, I think that is so much more valuable, possibly, than just sitting in, in you know, in a studio where and just being given feedback occasionally from your projects. Do you think that would be a way forward, then? Do, do you think... Well, I, you know, I personally, I think that uh, young people would gain an awful lot from just sitting with a professional photographer, mm -hmm. even from an, from, from an editing point of view and going through imagery, because we spend an awful lot of time in front of computers these days. I mean, I, I'm sure you're the same. Yeah, that's another thing I was going to say, is, is that, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult life, um, really. It's quite challenging. Yeah. Um, and... Increasingly, I'm sure you find the same, that a lot of sources of income have dried up, mm. you know. So um, I think it's fair also to really make young people aware of that, or perhaps they are already aware of that. But I'm, th I'm thinking also in terms of developing awareness and, and in terms of seeing the world around them and, and developing not just in terms of using you know photography to earn a living mm. but in also in order to understand the world yes because education is not just uh, no getting it's a not job. just about you know um i mean i've never had a huge buzz from earning money in the <laughs> sense that you know it doesn't give me huge excitement and oh wow i've earned such and such money <laughs> but but creating a good image or producing a good image for my client and who and he's happy with it is far more rewarding but we do need, unfortunately, you know, if I could opt out of the capitalist system, I would do straight away now. <laughs> but it's not easily done. <laughs> and so whilst I've got bills to pay, I, I need bills to send out. You know. yeah. But it's really getting the balance and, and, and also making time, you know, for good photography. Good photography in, in, in you know, sort of rewarding and... and Meaningful photography takes time. It's not about snapping. No. And I think too much snapping goes on these days. But perhaps I'm getting old.